Uh, my name is Michael Wallace. I am a professor of practice here at Tulane University in our Emergency and Security Studies program. And I am also a Navy vet, so I'm very honored uh, to be part of this panel uh, on a call to arms, advancing health care for veterans. And I'm joined with three individuals who, who are, and, and I, I mean this in every sense of the word, they are making a difference for veterans every day. We have Dr. Greg Stewart, or Doc, He's medical director of Tulane University's Center for Brain Health. We have Nate Boyer, who's a former active duty Green Beret actor, world traveler, philanthropist, community leader, and a professional athlete and former men member of the Seattle Seahawks. He is also the founder of MVP, Merging Vets and Players, which assists retired NFL players and veterans in their return to civilian life. And then last but not least, we have Chris Cox, He's a Marine Corps veteran. He's the commander of New Orleans VFW Post 8973. He's the strategic communications chief for the VA's Office of Integrated Veterans Care. And most importantly, he's a Tulane alum. So to start off, I'm going to ask a couple of general questions, and then we'll get into some audience questions later. But I wanted to ask a question of you all, and I'll start with you, Doc. Why is veterans health care so important right now? I think one of the things that, that becomes important, and I'm the non-veteran up here on the, on the stage, and, and we've got a group in right now, and I was talking to him earlier today, and, and in order to do this, I think you have to frame a little bit of, of where we are. So first off, at, at this point, it's an, it's an all-volunteer military. When you come in, you understand that you're at risk for death or injury. I'm assuming you knew that when you came in. Nate, Chris, you all knew that when you came in. You also knew that when you came in, you would be asked to do things that we don't generally do. So you would then be asked to either kill or injure other people. And you knew that. You all knew that coming in. So this is a group of individuals that have volunteered to protect God, country, and family to go out and to do things that we would not do in order to allow us to be here and do these kinds of things. So for me, that becomes the reason that we provide this care, is that you, y'all have done things in order to allow me to do things. So our honor, the group, to care for y'all and, and provide these things. And I think that there's, there's a lot of issues. Uh, we've, like I said, we've got a cohort in today. Uh, the invisible wounds, uh, I think, are very difficult. If, if you have something and, you know, have a limb that's been blown off or something, it becomes obvious. But things like uh, mild, moderate traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, moral injury, I think all of these things uh, are the reasons that uh, this is, is so important. And veteran suicide uh, is, is at phenomenal heights at this point. And the numbers that are quoted are probably about half because the suicide numbers that people are counting are things that you can say, yes, this is suicide. And they're not uh, substance abuse, drug overdose, single vehicle, motor vehicle crashes, things like that. Thanks, Doc. Chris. Let's face it. We're never going to be this young again. And our best days are not behind us. So from a veteran's perspective, maintaining your health and mobility and your ability to contribute to our city and our society and other veterans' welfare and, and the nation as a whole, it kind of hinges on whether you can move and whether you can think the way that you've always been able to, whether you can remember things. Healthcare, the older I get, let's face it, I'm. I'm over half a century old. The older you get, healthcare becomes more valuable. And at the risk of kind of a crass analogy, healthcare is like money. You never need it until you don't have it, right? So it's important that we pay attention to how the technology is progressing, how the, the laws are changing, how our access to healthcare is, is growing and expanding or shrinking in some cases, depending on and Spanish flu, we probably are not going to have to worry about Spanish flu, but now we got to worry about COVID. So that's a change in how we approach different elements of healthcare. 
the beautiful thing about it is when we came up through the ranks in the military, there was always this feeling of, this is my problem. I've got to look out for my service record book. I've got to look out for my health care record. I've got to look out for my dental record. But you're never alone. Never alone. You've got me. You've got Doc. You've got all of us. You've got the, the people in the city. You've got your, your coworkers, your employees, your friends. If you're not reaching out and just passing these ideas off on one another and, and figuring out best practices about how to manage your life and your own welfare, then you're doing yourself a disservice. Healthcare is vital to all of us independently and all of us as a whole, as a nation, as a city, as a people. It's important to pay attention to that stuff. That's just my personal opinion, but, but I'm in the healthcare industry, so I kind of got to pay attention to it. That's what I got. Yeah, it, uh, I agree with you, Chris, and it seems like uh, my second home is the VA these days, so yeah. I appreciate that. Nate. First of all, Chris's shoes are unbelievable. So we Pretty gotta, awesome, right? we got to give him some yeah. props there. Yeah, don't, don't forget the socks, too. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, no, those are, those are great. Uh, you know, I, I think f from my standpoint right now, kind of looking at things, you know, I joined in, in 2004, so we were, we were already at war just a few years after 9-11. 9-11 had a huge impact on me, and it was honestly the reason I joined. It was the biggest reason I joined. Um, but I also, like, seeing how much we were appreciated versus, you know, how it was in the past. It wasn't always like that. I mean, uh, always a shout out to uh, the Vietnam veterans especially, you know, welcome home if any of you are in here. Um, so we were very lucky to live in that time. And one of the reasons I joined, and I think a lot of people join, is knowing that if we didn't come back, or if we did come back and we weren't whole in some way, shape, or form, that can be physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever, that we would be appreciated, we'd be taken care of, and all of that. So I think making sure veterans are continued to uh, be looked after, looked up to, um, included in a lot of conversations uh, about various topics, but also uh, that, yeah, their, their, their health is, uh, and well-being is, is paramount, is important because we're not going to maintain that, that fighting force that we do need, you know, the defense that we do need here. Um, if there isn't that sentiment, if people don't feel like, well, I'm going to go do this, you know, I, I need to feel like I'm going to be, or my family's going to be taken care of if something were to happen. Uh, and also, it's such a different time now being that for the first time in 20 years, we're not at war um, currently. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I think that that's, that's important to like really focus on veteran issues at this point. Not that people that are on active duty, it's still not very important, it absolutely is. Uh, but thinking has shifted away from that and you know, in the way that things ended uh, in, in 2001 were, were frustrating for a lot of, of people that spent a good amount of their lives over there. Uh, and so like taking that all into account and making sure that those people uh, have a voice, are looked after, um, their needs are met, and you know that we are really focusing on veteran issues maybe more than we ever have, at least uh, in the last uh, half a century. I think that's, that's really important right now. Yeah, I, I remember when I was in, you know, it was that always thing that you're always going to have health care. You know, because you sign the dotted line, you're always going to have health care. And when you're in, you know, they make you do things. They make you get shots. They make you do things that you may not want to do. But when you retire, you get out of the service, I think uh, for some, it's tough to, you know, make themselves keep up on and keep on top of their health. So, very good point. So, uh, again, this is a question for all of you all, and I'll start with Chris on this one. So, what, what do you think is the biggest challenge or challenges to health care for veterans? It's a loaded question, Mike. <laughs> That's why Wallace. I started with you. Biggest challenge to health care. Some of them are self-inflicted. Um, I'm 54 years old. I'm, I've always branded myself as tough, not smart. And, and most times it's great. I can tough out a lot of things. I can figure out how to accomplish something. And it might not be the easiest way, but I'm going to get it done. I know that. And now in my old age, when I have to pay attention to medical, medical appointments and checkups and prostate exams, right? You got to, when you make an appointment, you have to set it. So a lot of it is self-imposed. It's my own, this is more important than this other stuff. Again, nothing is more important than your health. Nothing is more important than your health. You need to pay attention. If it's the only thing I can get across, pay attention to that. 
And the other part is navigating the system, right? Uh, you mentioned earlier VA, I'm a VA employee. I'm, I'm a big believer that if you don't vote, you really shouldn't be the one who's complaining. So I, I'm trying to change the system from the inside. That's why I got employed at VA. But it's a hundred year old system, which is fantastic because it's got over a century's worth of research that's veteran specific. So if, if veterans are gonna get healthcare, I personally believe that VA is the place to go. The problem with that is, it's the nation's largest healthcare system with so many people in it. There's the wait times, there's the congressional attention, there's, for those of us who were in the military, you know, if you get very, very precise orders from the top of the chain of command, it's hard to deviate or flex or figure out a, a creative way to solve that problem, and that's the problem with VA. All the regulations are so very precise and so very mandated there's really no flexibility in the system. So we have to wait a certain amount of time. There's no considerations for people that are a higher priority or what have you. There is now a community care element, which is fantastic because now there's over a million community providers in, this, in the, the country that are providing VA care that are not VA providers. Um, but that can be overcome with changes in regulation and that congressional attention I talked about a little while ago, which, which has been a pain in my butt because I'm a communications guy, it's also driven positive change and opened up access for veterans to be able to access care for the PACT Act, for example, toxic exposures, talking about uh, Vietnam veterans in Agent Orange, or the burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan for those of us who were over there. Um, it's a real thing. Uh, some of the depleted uranium and, and things that veterans were exposed to. These are tied to presumptive conditions. I, uh, I just learned last week that veterans have a significantly higher percentage of ALS susceptibility. I know this because my wife was diagnosed with ALS a couple of weeks ago, so I'm her primary caregiver. It's a terrible, crazy time right now, but, but I'm here because this is important to me. It's important to all of us, right? Um, so I think I've talked too much and I haven't said enough. Uh, Self-imposed problems, navigating the system, goes back to talk to the people around you and figure out best practices about how to navigate those waters. That's all I got. Nate, what do you think are some of the Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with the, uh, one of the biggest challenges is getting the, the veteran to want to take the first step. It's, it has to be their decision, you know what I mean? And they have to commit to that, uh, whatever, whatever care they're, they're seeking or, or whatever. And sometimes it's... Um, yeah, for, it, forcing doesn't seem to work. No, it doesn't work. It, I mean, it doesn't work. It doesn't work with, with 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 MVP. It doesn't work with any any VSOs, and it certainly doesn't work. I think with you know physical care as well, um, not just uh, you know mental health care. Um, so that's the challenge. That's a, a huge challenge. Is like how how do you make things um, resonate with a veteran, you know, I mean, we're all different. We're the most diverse microcosm or one of the most diverse microcosms in the country. Um, a lot of people don't understand that until you're kind of around it and you're like, oh, wow, yeah, you guys do all think different. You're from all walks of life and all that stuff. I think people maybe associate because we all wear the same uniform that we all and we, we have to follow orders. Yes, but like that we all think the same way. And it's like there's plenty of orders I followed that I completely disagreed with. Um, and it was, as long as it wasn't something that was a huge moral disagreement I you know I did what I was supposed to do um, but we're all over the map so like finding different ways giving different options uh, for for opportunities and organizations and care that resonates enough with somebody that's going to make them take themselves to uh, you know the VA or whatever that facility is wherever that place is whatever that group is and actually want to be there and want to learn and want to uh, uh, you know, receive uh, the care they deserve and, and feel confident in, in saying or asking for help if you need it, you know? I mean, that, a lot of those things are tough because it's so ingrained in us to like suck it up, drive on, don't, don't ask for help, you know? You, you're, you're, you can do it, you can, tough, you can just stick it out. And, it, you know, it, there's value in that in, on the battlefield. There's not value in that, in my opinion. Uh, afterwards, you know, so that's the biggest. That's one of the biggest challenges, like getting past the the front that we all often put up of, of like I don't I don't need that, you know. I'm or or the and that kind of falls in line, I think, with um, 
with uh, survivor's guilt and all these things, you know, thinking that your experience, well, my experience, yeah, I went to, to uh, yeah, maybe I went to war, but I didn't see or feel what these guys saw and felt. And I didn't, you know, my best friend didn't die in my arms and I didn't lose a limb and all these things. And it's like, I understand that, but you know, your, your experience is still valuable and you still deserve to get taken care of. I mean, you, you, you stepped up and volunteered to, um, to protect us and you can, it's okay to let people look after you too. Yeah. I don't know how many times I got the, uh, the whole 500 milligram ibuprofen, you know, drive on uh, type of thing. So but I've still got a bucket of 500 milligram motion at the house. <laughs> so if you need any, I got it for I've you. I've got 800. So, <laughs> you know, but, uh... <laughs> so Doc, what do you think of the challenge? You know, I, I think that what they say is incredibly important and that's there. And, and a lot of times what, what I see in the veterans is someone else deserves this more than I do. Uh, I don't need this. They need it more, so I'm not going to, to partake. So I think getting that uh, message across. And I think consistency uh, in the care. Uh, I think that, that a lot of the stories that you hear on, on, oh, I had this horrible experience at the VA, is probably 10% of the time. And 90% of the time, it's very good. But you only hear about the 10%. So you're scared to go in. Uh, and, and get the care you deserve. Um, and, and I think if there was uh, a way to, to provide consistency uh, across a vast system, not even within the same VA, the same, uh, same building, but across this vast system, I think that that would, uh, is probably one of the big challenges. Yeah, I mean, it, he said it earlier. I, I don't know the number, but it's there's 20 some odd million veterans, I think, in the country. That's about right. I'm not sure what the number is, but it's a lot. You know, I mean, you know, we have, we have 350 million people or whatever, but it's it's a, that's a big number. And when you go to these facilities, yeah, I mean, they're they're government facil facilities, so it's not Cedar Sinai. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just it's not. Um, but the people there, most of the people there, are doing their best and. They're probably getting paid a heck of a lot less than they would if they were working somewhere else uh, in the same uh, system. And a lot of them, most of them do care about the veteran and they really do. They're, they do what they can, but it doesn't make it not depressing sometimes to, you know, to walk into, it's like going to the DMV. It's a government office right. too. No one wants to be there. You know what I mean? It's kind of a similar thing. So it's, it's tough. But uh, yeah, to your point, Doc, like most of those, most of those people there and most of the experiences, they are positive, but you got a good experience at the dentist, you don't go home and tell your family about it at dinner. If you had a bad experience at the dentist, that's all you're talking about. Yes, so. exactly. Yeah, I, I actually had a good experience at the VA and I wrote to the director and I said, hey, great sir. And they wrote back and Are you, did you really mean to send this? I was like, <laughs> Are you being yeah, sarcastic? actually I did, it was great service. So Nate, when I was doing research and I was looking at your, your group, the MVP, I was fascinated by it. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you came up with this idea and, and, and how it's, it's helping veterans and, and, and retired football players? Of course, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, uh, as you would mentioned, I, I was in the Army for about 10 years, first half on active duty, second half in the National Guard. And when I was in the National Guard, I, went, I was in the Texas National Guard, uh, and I was also going to the University of Texas, and I walked onto the football team, was playing, uh, playing football there, uh, but still in the military. And in the summertime, I was deploy I actually went to Afghanistan a couple of times in the summers between uh, playing ball and going to class and, and all that. And it was very high tempo. Uh, I volunteered for it. I wanted to do it. I enjoyed it. Um, but I always had that locker room and the, the uniform to identify with and like structure and mission and all these things, um, a reason to stay in really good shape and a reason to um, practice something every day because um, yes war, war and playing sports are not the same thing but uh, but the locker rooms are very similar and the camaraderie and you know feeling like you're doing something that matters and then uh, I had a brief opportunity uh, in the NFL and when I got cut this was in 2015 I, I got cut in the fall and I had ended my military service in the spring of that same year so all of a sudden I had no locker room and you know the, the cool part is, is you can do whatever you want. And the scary part is, is you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so I was like, I don't really, I don't really know. I, I kind of like, uh, not too much constraint, but I want a little bit of, uh, some, some parameters here to, 
to narrow my focus. And it was just like an open book. And I was like, well, I don't have to get up at all if I don't want to and all these things. Thought about joining the military, going back into the military. I was 34 years old when this was all happening. And Jay Glazer, who I co-founded MVP with, he's a Fox NFL Sunday analyst. Uh, he's been around the game forever. And he's seen, he's heard this story a million times from former players, coaches, all this, uh, you know, people involved with the game that um, they, they typically it doesn't end on your own terms. Sometimes you get to, you know, the Peyton Manning story of winning a Super Bowl and riding out on a white horse, but 99% of those situations, it's not like that. Um, and these, these, these people will often isolate and not want to associate with the game anymore. They can't even go back to a game. And I noticed that um, I was feeling some of those things from my military uh, side too, like my veteran side. It was, I was associating with some veterans and all that, but like the, the actual military and my buddies that were still serving, I was just like, I don't want to bother them. Like this is, you know, they're doing something important and I'm not. And Jay convinced me uh, that this was a good idea for us to bring these two groups together and um, just recreate a locker room in some sense. And we didn't know what that was going to look like. It took a long time for us to figure it out. Uh, but eventually it ended up just being we made up weekly in the gym and we'd, we'd work out for about 30, 45 minutes together, get a little sweat going. It's kind of like a smoke session in the military. It's not that bad, but, you know, it, it's meant to be a little bit challenging because it kind of makes you vulnerable and... Uh, you bond with the people around you, even if you've never met them, th if you go through something together. And then we huddle up on the wrestling mats afterwards and we just talk through our stuff. And it's an open forum, peer-to-peer -peer coaching. Uh, anything is on the table. It can, and, and we always encourage people to share wins too, so it's not always you know, the tough stuff we're going through. Uh, but it's just uh, that camaraderie and, and, and having uh, people that have your back. But, but also, the, most, the coolest part of it to me is that a lot of the veterans are opening up to a different group of people too. You know, they're opening up to uh, um, not just people that went to, to, to war or, or, you know, experienced a career in the military or a short time in the military. It's people that on paper have a very different background, um, but the athletes look up to the vets and the vets look up to the athletes. And um, it's been, it was, it's one of our first sessions we had uh, and we sort of depicted in the there's a movie about MVP called MVP. We sort of depicted in the movie, there's a, um, oh, yeah, we absolutely depicted in the movie, Tony Gonzalez, who is a Hall of Fame tight end, one of the best to ever do it. He came in the first time to a session and he told a story that he'd never told anybody except his wife about how he'd been out of the game for, I think, just three months or something. And they went on vacation to Spain and he was like a wreck, you know, and he broke down. It was like what he didn't, you know, tell, her was like, the reason this was all, like, the, 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 uh, the, the combine was happening, just, which is, just went on last week, and like the next season, all the hype around the next football season's happening, and he's not a part of it for the first time since he was, you know, eight years old. And he was 30, 38 years old at the time, and it was just like crazy f for him to even, he, he just so detached from it, and it just really, mess with him and he told the story about he when he went to dinner with her he broke down in tears she thought he was gonna uh, leave her <laughs> and he was just like no I, I i'm not leaving you i need you you're the, you're the only consistent thing i have in my life um i just miss all this and i feel like i'm never going to be great again and he told that story in, in a huddle with a bunch of these you know other athletes and veterans as well and the vets you could just see it on their faces. They were just like, that is exactly what I feel. That's exact. I get, I get that. I can't believe I have something in common with Tony Gonzalez, but I absolutely do. And some of those vets in that huddle were living in a homeless shelter at the time, and they felt that connection. So that was, it's like moments like that that uh, are, are really, you know, people feel like they belong. They should all understand that they belong. But I, I love that it's not just, not just uh, organizations that are just for, for veterans and or um, I don't want to create, get in the business of creating these, um, these, these, th th this idea that no one's ever going to be able to relate to you because of what we did. I mean, there's going to be some things that you're just not going to understand. Under, totally get it, but like, to to get in that mindset because I I'll do it, you know, and I, the the ego will pop up and I'll be like, well, they don't know anything. They didn't go. They haven't done this. They haven't done that. I did that, you know. But it's just it's not fair because everyone's got their own experiences, and you don't know what that person has been through and experienced as well. So that's one of the things I really like about 
uh, what we're doing. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, having having somebody to talk to who who kind of gets it, whether it's a veteran or, or an NFL player, that's yeah. that's, that's something. So, Doc, I uh, was invited and, and attended your your fundraiser last year for the Center for Brain Health, and some amazing stories came out of that. Can you kind of go into what do veterans go through when they come through your program? So the, the program is set up uh, for individuals with mild to moderate traumatic brain injury. And we were having the conversation earlier that blast injury, this isn't just getting hit in the head. This is breaching. This is uh, uh, firing guns, artillery, things like that. So all the blast impact gives you, uh, can give you brain injury. Uh, psychological, post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, moral injury. And so what happens is that uh, referrals made, we go through uh, an intake process, and then we bring them in for a three-day evaluation. So they come in, and for three days, this is, uh, uh, you know, tough. Uh, so talk about being vulnerable uh, because you're coming in and, and yes, some of it is, is true medical uh, MRI, x-rays, blood work, uh, but it's also psychiatry, mental health, integrative uh, health uh, to, to kind of spirituality piece. Uh, and really going through this for three days to, to come up with what's going on, <clears throat> speech pathology, neuropsychological evaluation, hearing balance, uh, visual types of things uh, and and so really kind of come through uh, and figure out what's going on with these individuals uh, and we've got a guy in now who who kind of says good news bad news is y'all figured out what was wrong with me uh, before I thought I was just an asshole and, and my and my wife could deal with that um, now I know what's going on with me, so I'm trying to deal with it. My wife's not sure how to, how to take me now that I'm not as mean as I was. Um, so, so bring them in for the three days, really go through, figure out what's going on with them, work on getting them back in their community uh, to be able to, to do some of the treatment and some of the things that, that they need but then bring them back for a three-week intensive outpatient program, which is less medical and way more integrative. Uh, so this is music therapy, art therapy, equine therapy, uh, yoga, uh, a lot of this still doing physical therapy and balance and, and working with cognition and mental health and, and all of that as well. But three weeks of bringing them in, doing this all day, every day, to really try and, and get, kind of jumpstart their, the, their continued recovery. And it's a, it is a, uh, it's a journey. And part of what we do is really try and work with the local VA in order to, you know, we can do some things in a very short period of time that, that VA is not set up to do, but to be able to hand this back uh, so we're not in competition with the VA, really trying to, to help uh, these individuals and, and get this, uh, this process started for them. Uh, and, then, and then continue to follow up and work with them long term uh, in order to, to help, them, uh, help them come home. Yeah, they, they, you really had some inspirational stories, and uh, that, was, that was great. Now, you mentioned the PACT Act, Chris. I did. And that was a law that was passed by Congress last year. Can you, can you tell everyone what the PACT Act is and how that affects? That's an excellent sense? question, Mike. Appreciate it. Talked a little bit about how the laws change every year. Before I get into that, I want to say um, Tulane Center for Brain Health uh, the, the creative ways that you're approaching healing and holistic health with the, the spiritual side, the mental side, it's, it's a wonderful example. I'm not going to lie. Even VA is, is looking at your techniques, your policies and procedures and trying to replicate them or at least lay the groundwork to be able to replicate them. So Thank I, you. I'm very happy to be here with you. Thank you so much. Uh, PACT Act, right? So laws change every year. Uh, the, the access points to... to Veterans health care open up and become more wide every year. The PACT Act uh, was based on, uh, there was an Army gentleman who passed away a number of years ago with uh, a condition that was attributed to the toxic fumes that came out of the burn pits in Afghanistan. 
uh, or Iraq, I can't remember exactly, Iraq. But it was the overwhelming evidence that his illness was contributed, was contributed to by these toxic fumes overseas laid the groundwork for con Congress to pass the law. So now VA has several different presumptive conditions that are, if you were, the, like some of you may have heard of the Blue Water Navy in the Vietnam era, people that transported Agent Orange overseas to be used uh, to defoliate the jungles and Amer during the American offensive in Vietnam. Those folks uh, have presumptive conditions. ALS, as I mentioned, is one of those presumpt presumptive condi conditions. Um, MS, uh, cancers, different things. Um, so how do you engage in that? It's just a name, PACT Act, right? The most important thing is if you're a veteran and you were in these locations at these times, and this is not gonna end now. So if you, if you have veterans who are in your family, friends of your family or whatever, <coughs> maybe they haven't deployed, but maybe they will. Please spread the word that VA, that 100 years of research, if they can go there, get a toxic exposure screening, go to talk to a VA provider, and get entered into the record book, if these illnesses become prevalent later on in life, they can be attributed to that, and VA can use that information to help build better treatments for future veterans. I tell veterans all the time, don't go to the VA for yourself. Go to the VA to keep it running and make it better for the people behind you. Right? Veterans, it all resonates with us. We're never, like Matt was saying, we're never doing it for ourselves. We're always trying to do it for others. So if you put yourself in that mindset and you engage with the VA early, it'll help, help the veteran enroll in healthcare, become a part of the record for the VA. And also if there is some sort of condition or ailment or injury that is being exacerbated with age, they could put in a claim for disability, a disability compensation, so that could, they can offset if they have to go from a full-time employee to a part-time employee. So there's a two-pronged way to approach engaging with VA as it relates to the PACT Act. Uh, I just want to say there's also additional law called the Compact Act. Don't get confused with these two things. We talked a little bit about mental health and suicide prevention and, and how, to be perfectly honest, one, is, is too high of a number when it comes to veterans or anyone taking their own life. But the Compact Act is, if you are a veteran and you served more than 24 months of active service or 100 days in a combat zone, or if you're a victim of military sexual trauma, you can, and you are, if you say, I'm gonna kill myself today, today, today's the day, I'm gonna do it. And you get to any emergency room anywhere, any community emergency room, any VA emergency room, anywhere, V VA will pay for the ambulance, VA will pay for the treatment and stabilization at the time, VA will pay for prescriptions related to the event, VA will pay for 30 days of inpatient or residential facility treatment after that event, and 90 days of outpatient treatment, Compact Act. The, the important part about that is to remember the laws change all the time, every year. If you know a veteran who has said, no, you're not eligible, don't bother with the VA, please tell them to keep their eyes open please tell them to find out more because VA is becoming more and more accessible. Not to say that the community providers, the Tulane Center for Brain Health or others don't provide an equivalent level of care, but let's face it, most people are blue collar workers, lower income, middle, lower middle income bracket type folks and they can't afford the like valuable effective health care for unique and specific ailments. I'm telling you. Knock on the door, ask the question, let them know they need to, they need to engage in their own health care. Does that answer your question, Mike? It does. And, and then some. Sorry. Yeah, well, I will also say that the, the VA has gotten so progressive. They have a, an app for your phone yeah. that works well. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of information out there, and they're doing a good job getting it out. So it looks like we have about 10 minutes left. Do we have any questions here for the panel? We have two microphones up here. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. No, go ahead. All right. Often it's said, if you've been to one VA, you've been to one VA. What at the New Orleans VA do you think is setting an example for others across the country? And what do you think could be improved to meet the standards of other VAs? Wow, dude, that was a very precise and specific question. I like it. So there's 174 VA medical centers in the United States and in Puerto Rico and in Hawaii, which covers Guam, the Northern Marianas, and uh, other Pacific Islands, right? The Philippines, Manila, things like that. Um, 
every federal facility, every federal building is on a 100-year lease. If you lived in New Orleans for a little bit, you know Marine Forces Reserve used to be stationed in the Bywater, and then they moved over across the way to Algiers Point because that lease expired and they had to find a new location. VA hospitals are like that too. The, the accelerated rate that the New Orleans VA was built was because, of the, was because of Katrina. I have photos that on my laptop, I'd be happy to share them with you, about the flooding that took place at the old VA hospital near Charity. So this one, what's beautiful about New Orleans and Denver and Orlando and all the new facilities that are being built today is you can fit a hospital bed through the hallways, a modern hospital bed. The, the, the ones that they use now are from me to the dock and long because they have a lot of sustaining healthcare things. That's just one example. Uh, there are two MRI machines in this one. But to get back to the root of that question, what makes VA special at each location is not the building or the equipment, it's the people in it. And veterans in New Orleans are different than veterans in Los Angeles. Different expectations, different needs, different family requirements and things like that. So if you've been to one VA, you've been to one VA, that's true. But the quality of care and the attention and the respect that you, you should be getting, that's absolutely the same everywhere you go. And if you've got a problem with that, please let me know, because I will be happy to pick up the phone and fix that for you. And I've got my card right here, so let me help you out if I can. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for this panel. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to have a preface before I get to my question. Mark Twain had a very good quote. Patriotism is the refuge of a scoundrel. <laughs> you guys are the opposite of that. So I don't think any of y'all are scoundrels. <laughs> for Mr. Uh, for uh, Sergeant Boyer or whatever, thank you for what you did for telling Colin Kaepernick. A lot of people don't realize that you were the one who was responsible for that. And I think that what you did was a great service for this country. Uh, for the doc, Fernando Rivera and the people at the VA here in New Orleans are doing an outstanding job because I'm a former um, um, respiratory therapist at the VA. Oh, nice. And also, uh, um, the person, when you get into a firefight, the first person you call for is your mom, and then the second person would be Doc. the medic. Right. Yep. Um, <clears throat> this is somewhat related to health care, but I do think that if the, the country would embrace the model that the VA uses, this would um, be a great service to this country. Uh, so if any of y'all want to chime in on that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Justin. Um, hi, my name is Justin, and I am the president of Wave for Warriors, which is a veterans advocacy organization on campus. And my question, you talked a lot about laws and how they're always changing. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to engage Gen Z? I mean, I wasn't even alive during, to engage Gen Z, people like me, I wasn't alive during 9-11 with sure. veterans issues such as burn pits and all the rest that comes with that. It's Gen Z, that's an interesting, interesting thing. And I'll try to be quick and succinct. Um, Way for Warriors, and I, 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 we have a relationship with, with y'all, which is fantastic, I love it. Uh, I think more than anything else is keeping the doors open and listening more than talking. Your priorities are different than my priorities. Uh, my, my, I'm at the tail end of my race. You're just starting yours. So if, if we can listen to your people and identify your needs and what resonates with you and then be able to provide guidance or provide services or provide assistance for, to help you get a leg up. Like I said, you're not in it alone. That's probably one of the hardest lessons to learn as you're growing up. And it, with a different language and a different culture, it's even harder. So the, the reality of the situation is we need to listen more and communicate more, talk more allow us to be someone that can give you a leg up and help out. That's what I would offer. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, thank you for being here and thank you for all you do for our veterans. My question ties together a couple of themes that you brought out, Chris, and that um, has to do with uh, uh, delayed onset uh, uh, type situation and also navigating the system. And uh, my question is, how do you feel the military is doing for those who are currently in the service and training them and preparing them to be proactive early on in accessing health care even if there maybe isn't 
uh, an evidence of the need at the moment, but being able to utilize this, what I would say from outside looking in is actually a pretty impressive system. So how does, how does the military help that transition? Can it be improved? I mean, I, I, I'm not on the panel, I'm the moderator, but I'll jump in <laughs> and say that uh, uh, it was very confusing. Uh, the military actually lost my dental record. Uh, so I was kind of going into it a little blind. But again, I think the VA does a really good job of educating. Once you get in the system, once you kind of crack that code, which has gotten easier, um, it's, it's, it works. But you just have to get in there, you have to crack that code. I think the military, of course I haven't been in for a while now, but I think the military could do a better job of kind of preparing whether you're retiring, whether you're getting out after that first or second tour of kind of life afterwards. And again, I haven't been in for a while, so I'd be interested to hear if, if people have gotten out more recent, if they do a better job. But when I got out, it was, it was kind of like, thank you for your service, take care. I'd be happy to talk to you like at length after this panel is done, because I have a lot of insight that I could offer you. Oh, brilliant, I love it. Next question. Thank you, sir. Okay. Hi. Um, a little bit of a preface. So I am the children of veteran of, of, of the Army. I'm a child of the Army. I hate to say like Army brat, but <laughs> so both of my parents were in the Army, uh, and I lost my mom in 2021, right before the passage of the PAC Act. After like a decade of fighting for benefits increase, the VA was like, no, that's not service connected. And now, of course, under the PAC Act, it totally is. Yeah. Uh, so going back to what you were saying about like how the VA is kind of rigid, and that comes from congress congressional oversight. Uh, tiny piece of information. My next move is to go to law school to study uh, disability and housing and healthcare for veterans specifically. Uh, so for me, I guess I'm wondering, do you think there's a way to like utilize the, the institution that is the VA, the hundreds of years of research uh, to get ahead of, I think, the reactionary nature of Congress and like lawmaking, right? Mm -hmm. So that we're not losing veterans before we're making that is progress a darn good for question. them. A real good question. Uh, we're running out of time. I want to talk to you. I got a lot of good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So real quick, we, we have about a... No, I was just going to say, uh, bless, bless you and what you're already do, thinking about doing, but you're already doing it. That's really cool. Um, and I know your mom would be proud. So yeah. that's cool. <laughs> so we have about uh, a minute left. So uh, any final thoughts from any of you all? And remember, it's a minute. <laughs> I, we'll start this in. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, so, uh, NOLA VFW Commander, 531 Lyons Street, every Thursday night. If you are a veteran, have a veteran in your family and want to just get to know them more, or can re uh, refer anybody to come to it, that's our open house. You don't have to be a member, you don't have to be eligible to, be, to come and hang out with us and learn more about what we do, why we do it, and engage in some of the things we're trying to do in New Orleans. 531 Lyons Street, come and see us Thursday nights. Uh, after six, yes, sir. Uh, no, I mean thank you for thank you for listening. First of all, I, I think uh, she sort of answered your question a little bit, which is really cool, you know. Um, <laughs> but that's you know it's it's going to be you guys that are going to move this, keep moving the ball forward, and uh, keep improving on what you know people have been trying to build for a hundred years, and uh, it's really it's really special. So I'm just I'm grateful. Uh, to have you know young people like you guys uh, picking up for us it means a lot. And, and I would say, as as a last piece, I think one of the things that's real important is to to ask, to to look for what you need with care. Don't stop with if the first no, if the we don't do that, don't stop there. Uh, we're seeing guys who are. 10, 15 years out, uh, Vietnam veterans who no one really understood what was going on, and they just kept looking. So I would say that if you are searching and can't find it, keep looking. Don't stop. Well, thank you all very much. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs>